one of my friends sent me this, I guess. It's not a, a YouTube video. He's taking this from a, a chopper, I guess. So it's Mount Erebus, which is in Antarctica, I think. Wasn't there a plane crash there a, a few years ago? This is why my job's fun. Because you get to do... I didn't do this, but you get to do fun things like this. Yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess I thought I remembered that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess you could do it commercially from New Zealand. I guess New Zealand's not so far away. I guess November would be their summer. Now is their summer, so it would be 24 hours of daylight, and um, yeah, not good. Anyway, so. But on a brighter note, this is good. Have fun. Go out in the chopper when you're down in uh, Antarctica. All right, uh, how are we doing? 7:58. Uh, so let's get to the material for today. Um, get to see someone's tell a lot about someone's life from looking at filing systems. Okay, um, how's everybody today? Everyone's fine? Yeah, good. It wasn't a completely rhetorical question, but uh, I guess that's it. You see, everything's fine. Um, Nick mentioned you got some emails, maybe not from anyone here, about the format of the exam. It's no different from any other exam, uh, but it will be truncated at the end. We won't, you won't have four hours to do it, for those of you who might have used four hours in the past. Um, so it is going to be in here. It is 4.40. Um, the next exam probably is scheduled for 6.40. I think they're scheduled in four uh, two-hour increments. And so uh, I think the official time is 10 minutes before that. So it's 4.40 to 6.30. And the reason is that to get people out of here so the next place can, uh, can set up, etc. So in fairness, in deference and fairness to the next uh, group, then uh, we should be out of here by, um, uh, by that time. Um, so that, that's the, the deal. Um, anything else? I guess we also had some, I had an email from a conspiracy theorist who thought, I don't know, he might be here, so I should be careful what to say. I did invite him to cut him or, yeah, him to come here today. And that was that there's a zip line stuff in the beginning and there's, it overprints your talking and were you telling them all the stuff about the exam that I don't know now and perhaps you should, should subtitle it, but I'm not going to subtitle the video, but um, I'm not sure there was anything that was uh, talked about in that beginning part talking about the zip line which is overprinted with the, the music from the um, from the YouTube video other than the fact that where does the line end up in the harbor do you see where it ends up looks kind of flimsy at the top all the stuff about the exam we said in the exam so just to reiterate so everyone has the same information three questions roughly the same as any other format maybe a bit more compact than the past because you don't have this extended timeline uh, hopefully everything's being recorded um, one question on um, external flows, one question on free surface flows, one question on pipe networks and pipes. So one question on 12, one question on 13, and one question on 10, 11. We did 12 last time, external flows. We kind of framed uh, pipe flow, so I can't write on this in, in a preview, but pipe flow is 10 and 11. External flows is 12, and free surface flows is 13. So we encapsulated everything that you need to know. I think, as I said last time, everything, if you do a screen capture um, on this, if you do a screen capture on that, then you should have everything you need for this test, I think. And you know I'm not, I haven't, if the past is the key to the future, then you can know what we said about prior exams in these reviews and what happened on the reviews of session. So I, my guess is that you have the essence of what's on these uh, tests there. Um, we'll record today. There'll be two review sessions, last uh, Wednesdays and today's. 
I, I catch a flight at 10 o'clock, so I'll try and get this posted as soon as I can. Uh, it is being recorded, and so I should be able to do that, subject to internet connections in Northern California, which might not be perfect right now. As you know, they're having big storms, which they need, but maybe a bit too much rain too quickly. Not too much rain, but too quickly maybe, um, to uh, offset their drought. And so that's the plan. And so we went through last time external flows. Um, you can probably work out how that uh, connects with the zip line uh, video in some way to start thinking about things. Uh, we said what the essence of external flows were to either figure out what forces are in structures or to be able to figure out from the forces and their interactions with other things what velocities might be, how they change between laminar and turbulent regimes at the, both the two ends of the spectrum and what you need to do to do those. And so we started out last time talking about um, pre-surface flows, and um, we'll continue on there today. So today we'll talk about free surface flows, and then we'll go back to talking about uh, pipe flows. Okay? So that's the plan. Any questions? Yeah. Alan. Are you an equation sheet? You're allowed an equation sheet. I don't have an equation sheet for you to take, but you can bring your own equation sheet um, to the test. So I, so, yeah. Second? Yeah, I guess what I mean by that is that well, the questions are the same questions before. So the questions won't be any different. So what I mean by open-ended is that you don't have four hours to do it. Yeah. So if that's the confusion of not open-ended, then uh, the questions will be the same style as before, but you will not have uh, four hours potentially to do it if you've taken four hours in, in your process. That, that's all. Wouldn't that be fun to be there right now? It'd be 24 hours of daylight. And so I guess, yeah, the other message is, actually, you're very privileged. Not because you're here with me, but, <laughs> but because in your chosen profession, you probably travel a lot in your life. And uh, you should never lose back to the uh, view of the fact that 99% of the world don't get to travel the same way that you probably would be able to and meet interesting people and do interesting things. And so, uh, so that's a, a, a source for some... Uh, excitement maybe for you in uh, in your coming future okay all right so I want to make sure I get through all of this so um, you can probably gauge from what we uh, talk about and spend time on uh, what the important things are we did this last time but uh, if you want to see it again maybe yes maybe yes maybe, maybe not um, maybe yes, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not. Um, yeah, well, let's do it anyway. So you can, I guess you can judge from um, views of what, what that might be. So, uh, get rid of this. Didn't do that. That's not underlining that's going through. So, anyway, so. I realize there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Well, we talked about um, different kinds of flows. Um, we spent most of our time on uniform flows. We spent a bit of time on gradually varying flows when the upstream depths and downstream depths are not the same, and therefore the energy grade lines and the, the slope of the beds are not the same. And we spent a very little time on hydraulic jumps and rapidly varying flows. Uh, so uh, their definition is, as we've talked about in class, for uniform flows, by definition, the depth upstream and downstream have to be the same. Therefore, V squared over 2G have to be the same at both locations. And so all of these lines, by definition, are equivalent, uh, as opposed to both non-uniform uni non flows, which include gradually varying flows and rapidly varying flows, which both have the characteristics that these are not the same. Uh, in the event that we have uniform flows, then uh, we can do this simple balance expression, which we won't go through again, but actually is kind of the key to the balances that we've used in other things like external flows. In this case, we're balancing momentum, which is really a balance of forces. If the velocities upstream and downstream, the depths upstream and downstream are the same, then, you know, this is old hat to you now, the force block that defines the force acting downstream 
and the force acting upstream are the same because they're the same depth and it's the same static and so momentum is uh, balanced automatically and then it just becomes a static problem of balancing the shear along the bed of the uh, flow domain with the component of the uh, weight that's acting downstream, the force acting downstream. So that's kind of a, a concept that was key to what we were talking about, at least for uniform flows. And if you go through that um, balance, then you come out at the other end with this idea that we can define the velocities of flow uh, as a function of some coefficient, which is 1 for SI, a Manning coefficient, which is a little bit like our friction coefficient. 1 over Manning coefficient is a bit like our friction coefficient or like our coefficient of drag. So uh, we've kind of, it's not the same as, but it's similar to uh, friction coefficient. I mean, this is the thing that links these things together. And they vary, you know, we've said this before without belaboring the point, this and this. And for 1 over n, we are always basically turbulent. So these are the coefficients will go there. And so this is just a number. Uh, we don't really have a graph like this because we always assume it's turbulent and it's a number. That's why it's a single number because it's horizontal. And we have a hydraulic radius, which we define as the wetted area, sorry, the area divided by the perimeter, wetted perimeter, uh, which is important. And this is the slope of the bed. And the slope of the bed, if we draw this out, and if I draw this carefully, this is this S0, and this would be 1. Right? So it's the, the ratio of those. And so this is the area, if you understand my figure. This is the wetted perimeter, not the surface, obviously. And if you want to get flow rate, then volumet volumetric flow rate is just equal to the velocity times the cross-sectional area. That's, this, this term only differs by, by that. And so they're, they follow directly from each other. I'm not sure we did very much in class. We kind of skipped through it, but you've certainly done some assignments that should um, move you towards this. Uh, we said that you can average if you have a non-uniform section with different Manning coefficients. You can average them in some way. Typically, the way of averaging them is not to take this these lengths and add them together. So in, in this case, you probably wouldn't do... 0 0.02 plus 0 0.04 plus 0 0.01 and divide by 3 to get an average. You would not want, perhaps want to do that. But you could weight them based on where those channels were. And uh, the weighting based on those channels would be to take this expression and to use for each one of these sections the appropriate components that would represent both the Manning coefficient in this one, the cross-sectional area flow, which would be this, the hydraulic radius, which would be um, area 1 over perimeter 1. So area 1 is this, perimeter 1 is this, only, not the surface. Not this, right? The reason it's not this is because the velocity of flow with, on that border between A1 and A2, they're just going happily along together. They're not dragging against each other. One isn't static and one's moving. And so that's the rationale for that. And then once you have it for this one here, which is this, then you can do it for the next one and the next one. And so that's the method of, of doing that if you needed to average them. If you have a wide channel, uh, as it gets larger than, if B is much greater, the, so I guess if B is much greater than uh, Y, then the hydraulic radius, if you look at what the area of the perimeter is, it just, just um, asymptotes to just the depth in that case. 
So if you have a very slim, wide, wide but thin channel, then basically the only characteristic dimension is really the depth, because it really doesn't feel the sides at all. It's really just saying that the, as you get a wider and wider channel, if it's still shallow, the drag on the sides makes no, <coughs> makes no difference to the flow anymore. Um, so that's all that's saying. And, and there are numbers here, so if you had a problem to do, then you'd probably just be given a Manning's coefficient. You certainly don't need to memorize those or bring those with you. Um, okay. And finally, it's worthwhile looking at these. We talked about these last time. So what, are, what are the most uh, efficient sections in terms of the, f the, the maximum flow you get for a, given, for a given inclination of the bed? What is the maximum flow that you get out of the section um, depending on the cross-section? And so the most efficient cross-sections are, if it's rectangular, for the depth to be equal to half the width, for the triangle to be uh, not, a, not an equilateral triangle, but a right angle triangle, where this would be 45 degrees. Um, if, it's sem if it's a circular section, then the bank full height would be equal to half the, you know, the half height of the circle. So in other words, this depth here is equal to the radius. And a more complicated geometry if it's hexagonal. So, which actually might not be an unusual geometry for a, uh, a, a section. So you could calculate if you're going to build one of these. If you wanted to build uh, the, uh, the levee between California and, uh, and Colorado to drain the Colorado River, you could figure out from those sections what the best way to do it. We quickly went through this in class. Um, I don't plan to, I'm not sure, need to go through again. Um, but this is just calculating what the, those components are based on you know, the appropriate. It's a Manning's coefficient, which is uniform. I guess uniform rather than constant. In this particular case, since this is angled, you need to figure out what the areas are by dividing this up and getting the areas as... I said I wouldn't do it, but I'm almost doing it. So in other words, in this particular case, the hydraulic radius would be equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3 divided by, I'm not going to break it out, well, I guess I can, right? This is P3, this is P2, and this is P1, sorry, okay, this is P2 and this is P1, right? And it just be the ratio of those. And if you know hydraulic radius uh, in this, you know the areas. Uh, the slope is given by 1.4 over 1,000. So this S0 is equal to, no matter what the units, whether it's metric or otherwise, 1.4 feet over 1,000. It's just the slope of the bed. And I think you have then everything you need to be able to calculate that. The units have to be in meters per and seconds. If you're using metric, if you're using BGS, they have to be in feet per. Whoops. They have to be in feet per second. And then K is equal to 1.49. Don't think you've ever had an example on a test that has been not been in metric. Don't plan to start now. So, all right. And so, in this case, I guess maybe yeah, you need to use n. You get n for the value of weeds, but to make an exam markable, easily markable, then you'd just be given a, a Manning coefficient. All right. So those are uniform. So everything to, to date is uniform. So upstream depth, downstream depth are the same. Uh, and then you can, in that case, you can use a Chezy formula. If that's not the case, um, then there's this other game we play with uh, to understand the river hydraulics, why you have waves and pillows in rivers, as they as referred to, where you have something, a hydraulic jump, basically. Um, and out of convenience, just by background, uh, we take the energy equation. Uh, and just to remind you, Take the energy equation, which is Bernoulli. Uh, 
um, plus well, the energy components of these. It's, this is useful, obviously, also when we talk about pipe flow. See, this is where I do all my education. I know that you're wrapped and linked to this. You actually write this stuff down as opposed to in a normal class where perhaps you'd just be not writing it down. Um, and what is the other part we had? I guess the other part is SF times L. So this is our head loss term, if you remember. We don't have a pump in the river, so we ignore this. We take the Z1, Z2 term, and we make um, Z2 minus Z1 over the length over which it occurs equal to S0. Nothing different from Chezy, right? This is the drop per unit length of the flow. And so these become basically S0 times L. And then what we also do is we combine the depth of the water, the pressure, in other words, you'd feel at the depth of the water. This essentially becomes Y2. And this becomes another term. So that these two terms together become what we've referred to as energy. And so out of this, this, this term here. So this is this y term, and this is this energy term, which is v squared over the second term, which is the inertial term or the, the kinetic term, uh, the momentum term, if you like, uh, which is a function of velocity. But we try and write it in terms of the flow rate per unit width of the section. And so this is what the section looks like. This is of some length L. This is of some height S0. And the other components are, yep. Is that a question or is that a stretching hand? OK. It's the Y2 Say it again. The Y2. Right. The Y2 is just the depth. This, is, this would be Y2 here. Whoops. This is the depth of flow. And really all it is is if you look at the section, which is looking like this, and this is the water depth. You can imagine that this term is equal to P2 over gamma, right? It's just the, If you're sitting on the bottom feeling the pressure, this is the pressure you'd feel. And that's why we convert it. So this is per unit width going through here. Oops, what's that? And so this is the flow rate at any point. So this is the flow rate at any point along the length of the channel. It should be flow rate per unit width, per one meter width of the channel. Uh, this is gravity, and this is whatever the depth of flow is at that point, whether it's upstream at y1, or it's downstream, whoops, at y2. And so what you can do is you can take the flow rate, which you know, typically. You can vary the depth of flow between some arbitrary number at zero and some larger number by cycling through these <coughs> depths. And if you calculate this energy equation, you'll get a line for a given flow rate, which will look like this. It'll asymptote to y equals e at this Component. It will have a tip on it, which is this critical energy, which is equal to the supercritical, sorry, the, the critical depth, and the energy is equal to three times the critical depth over two. And uh, above this line, it is subcritical flow, and below this line, it is supercritical flow. This is for, a f I think we've done this labeling before. This is a Froud number equal to zero. This is for a Froud number uh, less than, greater than zero, right? And this is for a Froud number less than zero. Is that right? 
Yeah. We've never used this expression. Um, this is just Bernoulli written the same way. Um, yeah. And so this 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 expression really re refers to both of these latter two terms, which are. gradually varying flow and rapidly varying flow, which just means to say that you have this extra degree of freedom. The, the, water, the water can either flow shallowly and very quickly, or it can be deep and flow quite sluggishly. Um, the ramifications for this are really, the concepts anyway, are covered in this, I don't think we need that per se, and we've done that, in this graphical uh, demonstration here. And that is that if you think of upstream flow being constrained by a, a gate in this particular case, so that the upstream water level is set at this, then all it physically means is if you take that upstream water level and for that given flow rate, this gives you the amount of energy that is present within the flow system, this amount here. If the gate is there to constrict flow, then by definition, this amount of energy, so this is the, the curve that we're on here, this middle curve, then it's saying that the flow can organize itself in one of two ways. It can organize itself at this depth, but at the same energy, it can also, which it should have if it's on a flat, flat base, it can also organize itself at this depth. And so, since these both have the same energy, and we're going in this direction, so this is my arrow, then this would be the depth that occurs downstream. That's, that's all this figure is saying, nothing more than that. And so it allows you to be able to say what the depths are upstream and downstream. And we talked in class about what happens if you maybe raise the, uh, change the water level here, etc., and move around, change flow rates. If you change the flow rate, you'll end up with a different curve, so if you increase the flow rate, I guess you're on a curve which is larger. So this is, if you increase the flow rate and do the same calculation for just choosing any value of y in this expression here, then you end up with a new curve which is this inner curve here. And you get different behaviors as a result. But I will cut you a break. Well, fine. So you can decide whether this is on there or not. Not. Okay, so, um, and we talked about uh, the last time we talked about free surface flows. The idea that if you are sitting upstream at some depth and you go downstream and you go up a ramp, so in other words, the energy equation, this is just Bernoulli's equation again. This HL is what? This is our. Um, slope of the energy grade line times length. Sometimes it's better to write it as a single magnitude of height drop. So in other words, if you drew our section in some way that this is S0 and this is L, this is the depth of flow upstream this is the depth of flow downstream. And we put on top of this this other term, v squared over 2g, upstream and downstream. I'm running out of space. Then this is the what we call the energy grade line. And if we draw a horizontal line here, then this would be HL. So sometimes we write HL as a length. Sometimes we write HL as equal to some gradient. I guess HL over L is equal to SF. Right? And so the reason for doing that is sometimes this occurs slowly over some length of the downstream length of the channel. Sometimes it occurs instantly as you go from some location to another, where it's not really important what the, the separation between the upstream is 
and the downstream is, all that's important is that it's gone through this drop. And so sometimes we write this just as a, in this way. But the crux of this problem that we did was that if you draw the flow rate line for this, the energy line for this particular system, and you look at the behavior upstream where it's 2.3 feet deep, and you go across here, you hit the line here, you go down here, and you find out that downstream it could possibly be this, this depth. But as we go downstream, we've gone up by half a foot. And so if we go across by uh, 0 0.5 feet here, is that 0 0.5? So upstream is 2.4. If we take off 0 0.5, we're at 1.9, which is this one here. So in other words, this would be the height that we would find ourselves at. So in other words, this, this would be the height that it would be downstream. So this would be this small drop in the free surface. This would be the new height that we, we find ourselves at downstream. If we want to be, uh, sorry, we, that's not right. Sorry. If we want to go across by 0.5, this would be the height actually would be downstream. So scratch that. And the reason for that is that by changing the height of the bed, by ramping it up by 0 0.5 feet, by going up here to this part here, is that we can only go from point 0.1 to point 0.2. It could rearrange itself in this way, but we can't get there because we've got to go through this almost this energy barrier to get through this nose. And so if we're looking at what this ramp would do to the downstream flow, it would be at this depth. If we want to get to this point, then what we have to do between this upstream point and this downstream point, we have to arrange it so that we go up high enough to be able to get through this bump, which allows us to get exactly to this point here. <clears throat> and then once we're at this point here, the flow can either choose to be downstream at this equilibrium point here, which is on this 1.5 <coughs> line, which is at a depth, an energy equal to 1.9, or it can be at this depth here. And there's some rules to be able to say what we do. And we didn't really talk about those rules. So that's the essence of what's going on. But um, I, if I were you, I wouldn't spend a huge amount of time worrying about E uh, in your stuff. This is just my way to plug it so that you would actually th maybe think about it and understand what's going on. Okay? So this is basically what we're saying. So if you start off here and you go up a ramp, then if you go up the ramp, then you could be organized in one of two ways. You could be subcritical upstream, which is what this is, at a, at a deep depth. You could then be subcritical downstream, which would be this. Or you could be supercritical downstream, which would be this. But the only way you can get to be at this point here is to go through the nose of this, um, this distribution. And you can only do that by this, this feature. That's basically what's going on. And so I think all of this is related to that. So, yeah. But you could tell from the time we're spending that how important that might be for you in your immediate future. Maybe in your future future, but not your immediate future. <coughs> Hydraulic jumps, uh, the, the only issue was that now, you remember when we introduced this, we talked about the fact that upstream and downstream, if you looked at the forces that were applied, for the case of uniform flow, those force triangles were identical, and therefore conservation of momentum, momentum was conserved. Force was equal, F1 was equal to F2. In this case, that's not the case. And therefore, when you look at the momentum equation, you, it actually turns out to be a slightly different arrangement. And so if you want to solve problems for hydraulic jumps, then we have to incorporate momentum we end up with another expression, which instead of being just energy, we end up with momentum, which is slightly different. Before it was y plus q squared over 2gy squared. And so now it's a function of y depth squared. And uh, if we uh, conserve momentum, if we conserve energy, and if we also use continuity, 
to make sure that the same flow upstream is going through the, the same cross-section downstream. <coughs> then we end up with the same kind of diagram as before, but we allow for the fact that we destroy some energy as we go downstream. So formerly on this energy plot, we'd relied on the fact that energy was conserved as we went downstream because the flow was basically inviscid, like Bernoulli allows us. There's no energy loss in the system. But if we have a hydraulic jump, there's all this um, turbulence that's present in this pile of uh, foam that develops at the hydraulic jump and the water turning over on itself and kayakers sitting here doing different things. It conserves momentum. And so, for instance, if we know our upstream depth, if we can write the momentum versus depth profile, again, just by cycling the, the depth from zero all the way through to some bigger number, then we'd get this profile from a forgiven flow rate. If we know the upstream depth is this, then we find a point here. We know that momentum is conserved, so we can find this downstream point here. And physically what that means is this. And it gives you the downstream depth. What is also happening is that on our energy grade line, because we have this discontinuity, if you like, that we get a, a, an energy loss in the system, then physically if we just went across here with each of these depths on the energy line, we'd find that instead of being one on top of each other at this depth, they're actually offset from each other. And this would give us the amount of energy that would be lost within the system as a function of all this turbulence. So, and that, that's all we said about that. All right. So, um, so, think about what we've talked about today. And uh, deal with what makes sense for the, the, uh, the final. So uniform flows might be a some place to, to spend some time. Any questions as we flip through this? You never have in the past, if there's been a question like that. But you're not very, listening very closely to me. Yeah. yeah. Reinforcement is always good, right? All right. So open channel. So free surface flows, open channel. Free surface flows are open channel flows. External flows, 12. Open channel flows, 13. And so uh, the most recent stuff we did, so the pipe flow, external flows, and free surface flows, as, as I said last time, are kind of the, the sharp end of what you might use in your professions as you go through. So they're kind of the culmination of what we've been doing. Again, things that you might want to uh, be aware of that we've talked about last time. Uh, the energy equation, this is kind of the crux of what we're doing. I guess we talked about minor losses. Not sure we care about that. Uh, we certainly worry about this a little bit. And perhaps this. So I don't think that's any different from what I uh, did last time. Um, so the crux of this is using really the uh, Bernoulli equation with the energy components that are present. Remember to write it in terms of upstream and downstream. Um, remember that if you have a big tank upstream and a big tank downstream, then these velocities are the upstream and downstream velocities. Large tank is a euphemism for um, zero velocity somewhere on, on its surface. Um, power uh, is defined, so this is what we've, we've sometimes written this as this, this is uh, watts, which is equal to Newton meters per second, we know that, Newton meter is a joule, so rate of doing work if you like, and this is the same as G times the mass flow rate, so we've Choose, choose your uh, poison in how you want to, to write this, okay? We've talked about uh, Moody's charts and what they mean uh, in terms of the order. Uh, actually, we have a Moody's chart. It's probably right here. Uh, we've talked about Moody's charts. We have above this uh, 
2000 level here. This is laminar. Bless you. This is turbulent. There is kind of a transition in here, but we don't care particularly about this. In the laminar regime, it's a function of Reynolds number. Nicely in the turbulent regime, this is flat, so it's not a function of Reynolds number. If it's a smooth channel, then it's this. If epsilon over d is equal to zero, then it's this one here. And we know how to deal with these. We talked about type 1, 2, and 3 type questions. Type 1 is when you get the flow rate given, which is the easiest because de facto you know the velocities within the system. Remember that when you're working out the Reynolds numbers for these, it's the Reynolds numbers in your pipe or your fitting that you're interested in, not the Reynolds number somewhere else. For instance, the Reynolds number in a big tank would be zero, right, if this is velocity. So remember that. I know I'm stating the obvious. I know you're way beyond this. Um, if you needed a Moody chart, there'd be one in the exam. If you otherwise were doing a question, you'd probably be told what the friction factors would be. Um, so you don't need to do that. As I think we said when we talked about this for the previous exam, this Cameo here basically says it all. Um, we will always take this to be 1, given by the fact that in the previous uh, equation it was 1. These are pump losses, I guess. Pump losses as positive if it's a pump, negative if it's a turbine. And if you do your, your math right, then it would turn out to be negative or positive. Major losses are velocities in the pipe, velocities in the fitting. Um, if you have multiple fittings, you need to sum them, uh, etc. Okay. And um, pipe systems. Uh, if uh, you need to look at pipe systems, then we know that they come in two flavors that you need to be able to... Um, look at. One is series pipe systems. By definition, you know that the flow rate that goes in the top end of this has to be the same flow rate that comes out of the bottom. And so, since the flow rates are the same, then the head losses uh, across the whole system have to equal the sum of the individual losses. So, in other words, if you were to draw the head loss as it goes across here, and I'm not going to be able to do this very well. This is head loss from the upstream to the downstream. Then I think in this particular case, the head loss on the top part. I haven't left myself much room. So this would be no loss at all as you go across here. The head loss on the top part would be a little bit because it's a nice big fat channel and you wouldn't get much loss. As you go down to the next one, it would be a larger loss. Not sure if I'm going to be able to get these all in. It would be an even larger loss in the middle one. I guess I can't. And it would be the largest loss in the bottom. So the point is that these individual components are cumulative in terms of a graphic. And they should be larger. Well, they shouldn't necessarily be larger as they go downstream. But you can imagine that if you're trying to squeeze the same flow through a big pipe, big pipe's probably quite efficient because it's got a large cross-sectional area compared to its perimeter. In this, you have uh, a smaller cross-sectional area and a larger ratio of perimeter. Actually, it's not quite true, is it? Because I think that scales. The velocity would be larger in this, so there'll be a larger uh, frictional loss. If the flow rates are in a parallel system, then uh, you have to worry about the fact that the flow rates are going to be additive. So in this case, all the flows are equal to each other, but the head losses are additive. In this case, all the head losses are equal to each other because it starts in this tank at this height, it ends in this tank at a given height, and of course, you know, if you subtract the pressure heads to get to these points, 
if you take your reference point on the surface, the upstream point here and the velocity downstream here, then these would both equal to zero and these would both go into your Bernoulli equation. Then because this water level has to be the same for both of these two pipes, the head loss upstream, the head loss for each of these pipes has to be the same. But the flow rate is additive. You get a flow in pipe one, you get a flow rate in pipe two. Clearly the total exchange between the two systems is the addition of those. Okay. Uh, and so you deal with them in slightly different ways. Um, so I think that maybe two more. Yeah, fine. So we're in good shape here. Um, pipe loop systems. What else in this case? What do we know about this? Well, this is just a, an exposition of how you might want to write uh, expressions upstream and downstream. Uh, again, if you have a big tank, which typically is the way because it makes it easy, er, and so you could write equations for going from A to B either along this top flow rate, flow topology, I guess. It's a, a connection. Or you could do it on the bottom one by doing here. And if you did this, you'd end up with um, Roman 1 and Roman 2 for each of these. And you can write Bernoulli's equation for each of them. And so if you do it for this surface, then this is Bernoulli on that top route. If you're writing on the surface, this is atmospheric. So this is zero. This is zero velocity. And this is whatever the elevation is. This is zero. This is zero velocity. And this is whatever this elevation is. De facto, the difference in elevation between those two points is Z1 and Z2, which links these. And all the other effort is applied to the head loss in this pipe here and the head loss in this pipe here, which are additive to each other. If you do the same for the second route, which again is linking A to B as a same flow line, but it goes through this lower segment here, then you end up with a similar expression. Big tank, sorry, uh, not big tank, atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure, big tank, big tank. This is exactly the same as before. This is the head loss in this pipe here, which doesn't matter whether it's going through here and then up here, or going through here and down here. These have to be the same as each other, an equivalent. And so, in other words, by definition, since these two expressions exactly e equal to each other, then the head losses in these final components have to be equal as well. So it's just a matter of rationalizing all of these. Um, and you could solve for the, the system using that. And so it depends what you're, you're given. And then there's an example uh, which you can look <coughs> at, which you um, may want to look at. Uh, if you're going to concentrate some time, I'd concentrate some time on series flow rather than parallel or branched flow. Be what to concentrate time. What timing? What time? Four minutes to go. So, are we still alive? Great. Oh, sure you will. Don't be such a pessimist. <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, three questions. You know. So, I'm not, not going to repeat it. So, um, but you you can see from this what you might concentrate on. So, I think it's narrowed down. All of these things are application areas at the end of this course. Well, a lot of the things that are in this last part, um, you'll just take for granted. So pressures on structures, fluid pressures go down in depth. Uh, I'm not sure you really need that, but I think you have that down pat. But if you kind of concentrate on the things we've talked about today, I think it would be in decent shape. Okay. 
Any questions before we pack up? No run. Sorry? Yeah, one page of notes. Yeah, same as before. Whatever you can stuff onto two sides of a, a letter-sized piece of paper, uh, pencil or pen and um, calculator. Uh, you don't, just to reiterate, there's no difference in the questions, open-ended or whatever. They're still the same as before. Uh, one question does lead into another. I think it's, there's, it's, it's fine. It gives you some idea of what the steps should be maybe to get the solution that you're after. Uh, typically, well, not typically, you're not really penalized if you slip up with uh, a wrong calculation and have to use that number uh, subsequently. You're usually given the benefit of the doubt if you get the equation wrong, but the number wrong as a result of that. Um, yeah, you don't have the luxury, I think, of uh, four hours this time if, you, if you've used that. So that's the one thing that's different. Yeah, go ahead. Will you or the keys be available to I catch a plane in, in an hour, uh, but Nick, we have regular office hours during the uh, the week. I think that means no, <laughs> but but I bet you could make an appointment with him. He has exams as well as you, so he's in the same boat as you. I don't have exams, but I won't be here. And Ferry uh, might set up exams, so. Have, how many people have you? How? What? At what intensity have you used TAs? Much? Some? No, not much. Should we fire the TAs next time? So, so uh, no, that's so great. So, so you got your answer there, but yeah. send emails maybe. Alan, yeah. For some are super critical tools. Is the number greater or equal to one or, or is it zero or one? Yeah, it can uh, it can only be. It I guess I think it's, I said it the wrong way. If it's super critical, it has to be greater than one. Uh, if it's less than one, then it's subcritical, because it's the velocity of flow divided by the wave speed. So if the wave if the velocity of flow is greater than wave speed, then it's super critical, which is super critical flow, then it's greater than one. If it's less than one, it's subcritical. I think I said it wrong. But you might not need that. It's been a pleasure. Sorry I won't be here on the, the exam. I like to shake people's hands as they step out of the final, but um, I come back on a red eye on Wednesday night, I guess, after all will be signed, sealed, and delivered for you. So I wish you well. Uh, hope it's been a useful class. I think you still can do SRTEs. You should do those. So it was interesting uh, stuff. It's useful feedback, uh, as long as you're not telling me I'm an idiot, but you can tell me that as well. Uh, it's always useful feedback. It won't help you. It'll help your successors. People next. I'm always interested to know, we've done some different modalities of delivery between classes, YouTube, out of town for me, and you doing quizzes with YouTube only. And I'm kind of curious as to how that works. I think it's always interesting for me. I've, I've, ne I've always struggled with how to remove some of the angst out of this for some of you that you don't know. You know, 30% is on the final, so you still don't absolutely know. You're not guaranteed your grade. I like the way that we do the grading with 110% for the exams because it gives some people a buffer, so you do come into the final perhaps knowing perhaps where you are better uh, if you've used, been able to get close to the end of that. Still don't know how to stop the bloodshed on the first test. Um, uh, I'd like to know that. I think it'd be good for everybody. It'd be fine for me too. Um, the carnage, I guess, yeah. Um, I kind of like the quizzes and the YouTube stuff because I think it gives you some control. Uh, those points actually count for a lot because they're straight half a percent of your grades per quiz. It's about the same, it's actually, yeah, it's about the same as the assignments. Um, assignments are equal to about 1%. 15% for 13 assignments is about 1%. Uh, and it's worth a fair bit, you know, you might come back and try and get a, an exam regraded for five or ten points, but compared to that, the quiz is quite a lot if you do the, the math on what those are. So I'm always curious to know what people's comments are on, uh, on other ways to do this. Um, we don't do 50% on assignments because people in the past uh, used to game that uh, because you can, you can game the system we have. And so the only way to, I think, assure independent work is, is exams. And so that's, that's the rationale for this. So, so do your SRTs. Uh, as you know, they close out at some stage, probably the end of the day, I'm not sure. 
um, and then they open up for me sometime after the final grade is submitted and everything's signed, sealed, and delivered. So that's uh, good. So, so yeah. So short, sorry that I won't be able to uh, shake your hands on the way out of the uh, examination chamber, which is here. Um, we have done a fluids practical at Bill Pickles in the past, sometime in late January. Actually, we only did it once. We were going to take the money we earned on the YouTube, which we don't earn anything. You can monetize them, by the way, and earn on the YouTubes. Um, but then they put ads on them, so I don't do that. But we talked about using that and taking people out to build pickles. I turned up once. My wife turned up once at the same time. Um, <laughs> Semi Esser was walking by. He's a professor you might know. And he'd stop by. So we sat there with 100 bucks behind the bar. And finally, you know, two or three hours into us being there, and you can imagine, um, a couple of guys at the bar sheepishly came over, a couple of energy engineering students, and sat down with us for the rest of the evening, but most of the money was gone by then. <laughs> so maybe we'll do a fluids practical again. Uh, I know some of you might not be above that magic age to be able to go to, to build pickles. But maybe people from last year, graduates from last year, will be able to come. Who knows? So anyway, it's been nice being with you. Hope you got something out of the class. Wish you well in the final, and uh, wish you well in your careers. Great. Have fun.